Hello, Miami. This is 305 Sports Now, your home podcast and channel for all things Miami sports related. I am Will, and I'm sorry it's taking a little long to give you a post game analysis of the throbbing at Death Valley between the Miami Hurricanes and the Clemson Tigers. But Thanksgiving is approaching, so I've been a, a, a bit busy, you know, as some of you can tell. And so on. Uh, first things foremost, I'd like to once again thank Alex Dono for appearing on the show the other day. Um, thank you so much for your appearance and your insight on the Canes. It was a a a great time uh, sharing some fun facts, including our love of Batman as well. And for those of you who have wa- been watching this episode, I if you, if you haven't seen it yet, please check it out. It was a very good back and forth between me and the WQAM host and then the host of the Locked On Canes podcast. I strongly recommend it. And uh, if you haven't listened to it yet or watched it, actually. More so than anything, because it's only on YouTube as of yet. I uh, I urge you to listen to it and watch it. It's a, it's a great time. All right, now let's go into Death Valley. The Canes get obliterated, forty to ten, a thirty point thrashing by Clemson and Mario Cristobal. The rest of the coaching staff are pretty much being criticized for uh, the way the game went, the play calling, etc. To give credit to the Miami Hurricanes, at least on the defensive side of the ball. They made some adjustments, and it did feel like at times momentum might be swinging their way as they were able to somewhat stop the damage and towards the end of the second quarter, uh, going into third and third, and even the fourth quarter, the fourth quarter, those last touchdowns by Clemson were on garbage time per se. But once again, the offense is, again, much maligned by the media, much maligned by me, much maligned by the fans, because the offense was absolutely horrible. I think it's... I think the last time the Canes had less than 100 yards of total offense was 1965, if I'm not m- mistaken. Uh, they only had 98 total yards. Ja'Curry Brown, uh, they had a plan for him. I will say Clemson did as they were able to neutralize his running capabilities as uh, he only threw 53 yards on 13 attempts and six completions, averaging only four yards uh, per average per attempt, one interception. Jake Garcia came in, did light a bit of a spark, all right, uh, going three for five. Only 15 yards, but he did have that one touchdown to Khalil Bradley that he looked like he did not want to miss on that target. Uh, in particular, uh, the running game was horrific, only averaging 30 yards uh, throughout the whole game. You know, Henry Parrish came in, you know, four for 12, carrying the ball. Jalen Knight came in, eight for 10. He was also not a very effective. Receivers uh, also had some trouble getting open as only re- only three receivers actually caught the ball in the game, both of them being tight ends, and one pass by Colby Young, right? Basically, the ball was not spread, right? It was four catches by Young, four catches by Mallory, and that one touchdown reception by Khalil Brantley. So that's what I'm referring to as only three receivers actually caught the ball, all right? Uh, Miami Hurricanes have a much more than that. Um, as far as the defense goes, Cam Kitchens is a baller, all right? If Manny Diaz found a guy on defense and hit, it is that kid, all right? That kid, 13 total t- tackles, nine solo on his own, two pass, pass deflections, one forced fumble. Ivy did get an interception in the game. Another guy on defense I, ha- I have a lot of praise for is Wesley Bassaint, the linebacker out of Central. Again, you know, he was all over the place, had eight tackles in the game, seven solo, you know, as well for Wesley Bassaint. Mesidor was a beast, two sacks in the game. The one that led to a fumble, and Jordan Miller almost rumbled it into the end zone. So the defense did have some life in the game. Actually, the defense put the Miami Hurricanes in position to try to take momentum away from Clemson as Miami only got seven points out of those three turnovers that they forced against the, the Tigers. But nonetheless, you know, they were not able to do anything else with the other two turnovers. As, as a matter of fact, they even gave up a safety on one of the Curry Brown got, got a, um, an intentional crowning penalty, in, intentional grounding policy in the end zone which led to a safety uh, for, for Clemson. So it, it was a horrific game. One of the main reasons why, you know, again, you got to go recruiting classes. Clemson has been stacking classes up for years. Miami has not, all right? And if they have, the development hasn't been good. So those are just things that you have to reassess and evaluate throughout the season. The one thing I will say about, about the Canes is that there has to be some sort of a change, you know, on offense, 98 Total yards is unacceptable. Jacuri Brown, who I'm sorry to tell you, although he's a three-star and is a great athlete, and you could tell the effort on the field is there. And I really feel for this kid. Remember, on this show, on this podcast, we do not bash college students. Okay, so this is constructive. All right, it, it's it's a, it, this is constructive. What I'm saying here, Jacuri Brown is an option-style quarterback with tools to be a a pocket passer. What I mean by that is, is that he's got a hell of a cannon. 
and a good zip on the ball. He's just got to learn to be a passer. He knows how to throw it, but he's got to learn to be a passer. And what I mean by that is he had Xavier Restrepo on a blown coverage wide open, which could have changed the dynamics of the game, you know, in particular, um, tie the game at seven and something would have happened, but he totally, once again, overthrows Restrepo. He could have underthrown Restrepo. All right. I mean, severely underthrown Restrepo and Restrepo would have been able to, to basically walk into the end zone. And that is something that your Curry, again, that I mentioned the Georgia tech game, you know, when he zips it and he throws it deep, he's missing guys, you know, Restrepo in the Georgia Tech game, he missed him by five yards. He missed, I think it was Colby Young or Frank Ladson by 15. All right. That's, those are things that in the offseason, Jacurry and in practice, Jacurry's got to work on is the accuracy. Frank Ponce has got to work with that kid on touch passes and the deep ball of when to throw it. All right. And exactly, you know, in terms of timing, he is, a, he could be, he has the potential to be a very solid, good collegiate quarterback. Okay. But the bottom line is he is an option style quarterback that was brought into the Canes, right? I think Jake Garcia is the better passer. I don't start Tyler Van Dyke against Pitt. I'm really sorry to tell you that. The reason being is because Tyler Van Dyke is coming off a, off a shoulder injury. And if anything, use him in the bowl game, if he does not decide to transfer, you know, as now another guy, Avery Huff supposedly is entering the transfer portal. We That's not yet official, but Elijah Roberts, Gilbert Frierson, that Frank all decided they're going to enter the portal. And expect more to come, you know, as the as the days start to progress and we get close and close at the end of the season. All right. Clay Ferraro said to me at the beginning of the before the season started that don't expect to see a lot of guys. Don't, don't be surprised if a lot of guys uh, don't go to the portal. I said, depends on how they finish the year. It's hard to complain when you're winning, but it, it's very easy to walk away when you're losing. And Clay was right. All right. But the season has been bad. OK, so that's one of the main reasons why we will see a lot of roster turnover. Uh, for the next year, All right? So don't expect you will. You should expect to see a lot of new guys in the lineup. The offense, uh, 98 yards again, horrific. Josh Gaddis. I agree with um with my friend William, and I agree with Alex as well. I do I do not see Josh Gaddis going anywhere at the moment because again, the continuity, the continuity that is uh that Mario does value, and I think the style that Mario wants to run. It's more or less what Gaddis brings to the table. Again, Gaddis is a, is a Bros Award winner, so he may just give Gaddis a pass, you know, as far as uh, the season goes by. But you 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 have to look at it and, and with this perspective. Number one, early in the year, trouble trouble with under ten yards. All right, okay. So meaning there's a five yard line, can't get in the end zone. So trouble scoring in that capacity. Tyler Van Dyke has grossly regressed, and I'm not just putting that on Josh Gaddis. Frank Ponce is the quarterbacks coach. Well, Gaddis is, is coaching the wide receivers and uh, scheming things up. All right, Frank Ponce works hand in hand with the quarterbacks. We've seen a regression from Tyler Van Dyke in terms of missing guys, and we've seen a regression from Jake Garcia. To be fair, TVD did improve as time went on. Okay, he had that. He had a great game against North Carolina, then got hurt later on, you know, in the season against Duke. You know, but the bottom line is that that's on Frank Ponce as well. It's not just Josh Gaddis. Okay, as well. All right, so schematically speaking, though, those things have got improved. Again, also, you had the nine straight quarters of no touchdowns. Nine straight quarters of no touchdowns. This team has four-star guys in the skill position. You should be able to get in the end zone. And then you have the um, the beating, you know, against, uh, against Clemson. And, you know, when you're getting blown out, usually the pass attempts tend to uh, tend to increase, but not in the Miami Hurricanes, all right? Only 18 attempts at, uh, throw, at throwing the ball in this game. 18 attempts, all right? The same thing happened against Florida State, okay? Florida State, they didn't throw the ball that much either. So the bottom line is that something's got to change. If Gaddis does stay, he either has to modify his system a little bit, or if he does keep his system, it's he better hope it's day and night. Like, you know, he better hope that this was night, dark, scary, gloomy, and, and wants to put everybody to sleep. And next year better be day where we're all happy and sunshine and you're, and you're mauling teams, okay? That's pretty much what you're going to have to do because if next year, Josh Gaddis does not, if he's still the OC, Josh Gaddis does not, okay, does not improve on the offense. Basically, a 180, he needs to go. And I do believe Mario will assess, all right, will assess, you know, every position, every coordinator at the end of the year. I do believe that's going to happen. But if Josh Gaddis is retained and there's no improvement on the offense, Josh Gaddis has got to go. He's got to go. And... 
I'm sorry. I mean, it, it has to happen because what's going to end up happening is that he's going to cost you recruits. All right. So the best wide receiver in the country that you could have probably gotten in Oregon is not going to want to come because Josh Gaddis is the wide receivers coach and the coordinator. All right. So it's not going to happen. All right. Then you're going to start to see running backs. not want to come in. Okay. And then, and then quarterbacks are not going to want to come in. So if a recruit, if a coordinator is causing you recruits and, and giving you headaches because you have to continuously defend why your coordinator isn't performing to the standard that is the university of Miami, that coordinator has got to go. As I mentioned in previous podcasts, Dan Enos, in my opinion, got fired for less. Dan Enos never had a 98 yard game. All right. When he was uh, coaching uh, with Manny Diaz his first year, lost to FIU. Offense was a bit stagnant at times, but never had a 98-yard game. I don't think he also went nine quarters straight without scoring a touchdown or had like 10 times under five yards and not been able to punch it in. Danny Nose didn't do that. And Danny Nose was gone. We got him Rhett Lashley. And, of course, you guys know how I feel about Rhett Lashley. Okay, I've been very vocal about how much I love the system, especially for the Canes. But what I'm getting at is things have got to change. Next week against Pittsburgh, I expect Miami to win. I think Jake should start. All right. I think Jacuri should look from the, from the sidelines or do a two quarterback system. All right. Um, with it, I mean, I'm not completely like 50 50, but if you see something that Jacar could do, bring him in, give, give, give the kids some reps in particular. But you also want to go to a bowl game. So if Jake plays the whole game, I'd be totally happy with that. But I don't think there's any reason why Tyler Van Dyke should play this game. I think you're risking his, his future and his, uh, his college football and NFL career if you put him in this game with such a depleted offensive line and him probably not being at 100% like we saw against Florida State, okay? So, again, total thrashing. Clemson really big man does. You could tell who has the superior talent, although Miami's record is second in the ACC. The gap between Clemson and Miami is extremely wide. Cam Kitch is, is a baller, and we got to win out this next game and win our bowl game. If we go 7-6 and six with a bowl victory, that – that saves it, okay? Because Miami hasn't won a bowl game since Mark Rick's first year, okay? So for everybody, that's it. So a, a quick short straight to the point, all right? I'll be giving you more analysis. Hopefully sometime this week, I'll try to do some recruiting stuff and some coordinator analysis stuff as well, more in-depth in regards to uh, uh, Kevin Steele and um, and Josh Gass. We'll see what happens there if I have time, all right? Because it is it is a busy week for me. But anyways, um, if you like what you heard, please do not forget to like, share, and subscribe to 305 Sports Now, right? Stay safe. God bless. See you soon.